Mismong si Pangulong Marcos nagulat nang biglang gustong palayasin ni Gibo, Sir Mualdez sa Pilipinas base sa balitang kumakalat. Nagulat si Defense Secretary Gibo nang bigla ang bumaliktad Sir Mualdez sa China ayon sa DND. Anong pinagsasasabi ni Tambaluslos na tinitignan niyan China bilang kakampi at pipiliin niyang maging tayong tigasunod kisa away ng China sa One China Policy. Pero hindi ito nagustuhan ni Gibo matapos insultuhin si BBM ng China ay sumunod sa One China Policy. Um, and working together and, and portraying your strengths and what you can learn from each other which I think is vital. Again, we'll come back to it. Um, Speaker Romaldez for the Philippines. Looking at our neighbor in the north, our big neighbor, we always look to it as a country that we should work with rather than to be in conflict with. And I believe even China looks at this CN as the future for its economic growth. And we want to present ourselves as responsible partners in this endeavor. Tila nakahanap naman ng kakampi si Tambaluslos kay Wang Silian matapos sabihin ng ambasador ng China na dapat pumili ng direksyon tatahaki ng Pilipinas sa kadahilan ng si BBM ayaw maging tigasunod sa China ang Pilipinas. So our relations now stands at a crossroad as facing a choice of where to go from here. I hope that the Philippine side will stay committed to the One China policy pursued by successful Philippine administrations since the establishment of diplomatic ties between China and the Philippines and respect China's internal affairs. Pero babala ng eksperto, kailangan na natin paghandaan ng war scenario dahil nasa mahigit 200,000 OFW yung Pilipinong nasa Taiwan ang kailangang ilikas ng Pangulo. Tapos ipalit natin si Tambaluslus sa China. Total gusto niyang paalila sa mga Chino. If you're pursuing an independent foreign policy, you you plan for the worst case scenario. We have 200,000 Filipinos in in Taiwan. And in case of the worst case scenario, uh, it will be the largest repatriation perhaps in, in Philippine history of overseas Filipino workers. So I think for the Marcos government, we plan for the worst and we use whatever tools that we have. And one of those is this supposedly an ironclad mutual defense military alliance with the United States as well as uh, strategic partnerships with other countries. But Karen, I just want to go back to the statement of, of China, right? If a more friendly um, party won in the Taiwan elections, like the KMT, the Kuomintang party, would the reaction be the same? I mean, at the end, I think it's because China, Beijing didn't like the results because the Taiwanese people sided with the incumbent, the Democratic Progressive Party, who has a stronger stance against Beijing and against China. So if President Marcos congratulated other the other candidates who are friendlier to China, my count, my hypo, the hypothetical would be, would the reaction be the same? Okay, all right. So I I'll move on to we talked about, of course, the Mutual Defense Treaty. Do you consider it an independent foreign policy move of this administration to strengthen ties with the United States? Because you do have some sectors criticizing that this administration has become too pro-U.S., that it's no longer independent, that it should actually uh, develop deeper ties with other allies as well. What are your thoughts? Uh, I think it's, it's wrong to assume that to truly be independent, is to be neutral. I mean, countries like Switzerland, they're neutral. But when you're neutral, then you don't have any values in your foreign policy. Uh, you don't believe on anything. You don't have a position on anything. So being independent also means equidistant, meaning uh, you, you strike uh, relationships with countries that are like-minded. And I think that's what the Marcos Jr. administration and, and the critics that are saying that this is a very pro-US, uh, let us remember the Philippines has a status of visiting forces agreement with Australia. It has a comprehensive strategic partnership uh, with, with Australia itself. It is moving towards a similar endeavor with Japan. So it can, it's not just all... It's not just the US, yes. except with the US, we have a mutual defense treaty. Right. I mean, that is uh, that is the oldest uh, uh, military and, and the sole military alliance of the Philippines. This is what makes us different from other ASEAN countries. We're the only country in Southeast Asia that has a mutual defense treaty. So to be truly distant with the U.S., it will be harder for us. I mean, because uh, given this alliance and this mutual defense commitment, uh, our security policy will always be aligned with, with the United States. 
Okay, now the Philippines and Japan has recently agreed to um, uh, hold a dialogue already and facilitate the reciprocal access agreement, right? That facilitates the presence of visiting forces from Japan and also conduct military training activities. Can the RAA with Japan be as binding and strong as the Mutual Defense Treaty? Or what would be needed for them to be of equal stature and standing? The, the equal stature might be a challenge because in terms of military capabilities and force deployment, uh, the U.S. Uh, is, is in a level way higher than that of Japan. And, and let us remember Japan's uh, Pacific Constitution only limits the Japanese armed forces to self-defense. But that idea under for, former Prime Minister Abe has already enlarged to a regional notion of self-defense. And this is why Japan has been reaching out to, to neighbors, regional neighbors. I think this will be very important if not we have always been seen as the test case in Southeast Asia of Japan's security uh, cooperation so we're the first country to receive uh, a security cooperation we're, we're gonna be the first country to receive official security assistance from Japan so I think Japan wants to also show the region that it's serious uh, uh, and one way to show that is that if it develops deeper uh, relationship with the Philippines as the test case and then it will go to other countries okay all right so moving forward uh, anything you'd want to add of course the chinese envoy has i think called on the philippine ambassador regarding the congratulations issue moving right. forward from this i think in the end uh the for us filipinos we must always ask uh is china treating us uh with respect because I think that is critical in any change in Philippine-China relations. Uh, this notion that, oh, we must negotiate because China is a strong power doesn't speak well of our identity as a, as, as, as a proud republic. I mean, at the end, if China continues to bully us this way, then uh, we must just we must need to do what we need to do in order to safeguard our national security and the welfare of our overseas Filipinos uh, in, in Taiwan. And at the end, I think a truly independent foreign policy of the Philippines means that it doesn't really need to think about how China will react to anything that it does. Okay, my last question coming from just what you said, I just wanted a holistic point of view here, is what what isn't the Philippines doing or what can we do better, right? Because we aren't the only country in ASEAN with similar issues of um, jurisdiction and a territorial dispute with China. I mean, you have other countries, Malaysia, for example, or Vietnam, where in trade is bustling. They have strong diplomatic ties, economic ties, and yet they have similar issues with the South China Sea. But of course, the Philippines, I would say geographically speaking, um, none of them have our issues, right? That's what they said. We're just way too central in our location that the interests of China really is in our zone but i've spoken with foreign experts who've said malaysia was able to do it vietnam was able to do it what aren't we doing at one point during the late president ninoy aquino's time noinoy aquino he said a great ship right he said a great ship to scarborough show right. china sent more and then we backed down then there were bilateral talks with former Senator Antonio Trillanes that was supposed to be good. There's multilateral, bilateral. My point is, where are we lacking here? Why did it come to this? Right. I think of all Southeast Asian countries, Karen, we're the only country that has basically done everything in the entire spectrum. On the one hand, we've become very accommodationist, even very friendly under the previous administration. On the other hand, we're the only country that took China to court. And in between those two extremes, we've basically done everything. So, uh, but for me, I think the key is policy consistency. I think the advantage of our neighbors in Malaysia and even Vietnam is that uh, they, they, they see a relationship in China, not just in six year cycles, mm -hmm. but in long term cycles, meaning there is an end game. So for example, this transparency, approach i would say because it's not even official policy in the west philippine sea my question is where is it going uh what's right. the end game here i mean uh -oh. yes we've exposed we've, we've named and shamed uh, china on this but at the end where is it going and what else needs to be done how do we talk to other uh, uh south china sea claimants how do we talk to other countries uh with regard to the south china sea issue so i think uh we 
in terms of homework, uh, there needs to be more internal consistency and coherence from the entirety of government in, in showing China that uh, the Philippines speaks with one voice and one set of uh, permanent national security interests. Ngayon, ikaw, bilang Pilipino, ano ang masasabi mo at reaksyon sa balitang ito? Mag-iwang ka ng komento sa ibaba at atin pong babasahin isa-isa.